my name is Josie Rourke, and I am the artistic director of the Donmar Warehouse, which is a 250-seat theatre just over the river. And uh, I've, brought a fr I've actually brought two friends today because Kate Packenham, who's on the end here, is both the executive producer of the Donmar Warehouse and she is also one of my greatest friends. Uh, we've also got for you this afternoon the most fantastic panel. So we've got Linda Papadopoulos, who's a eminent uh, psychologist, psychotherapist, a great writer on lots of subjects, often on our tellies, um, but also has done some incredible work uh, looking into uh, studies most recently, I think, about uh, the sexualization of children. Uh, which is a study she's done for the government and uh, is here as a great professional to help us think about friendship and about our lives. Uh, we've got Josie Barnard, who has written the book on friendship that she's got. You can hold it up for us there. Um, which is a fantastic journey uh, through lots of ideas of friendship in literature and also uh, her own and other people's lives. And then we've got Dorothy Kassoon. Is that right, Dorothy? Your Coomson. surname? Coomson. I'm Coomson. sorry. It's okay. My bad. Um, uh, who is a novelist and author and who's written loads of best-selling books, um, one of which is the most brilliant study into uh, friendship and what happens when friendships go wrong. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. Yes. Kind of. <laughs> I don't want to be too... It sounds, sounds really weird going, yes, it's the definitive book on it. But yeah. Well, it might be. And if you've not read it, then you should. So um, what I, I thought I would do um, uh, before we move out to our panel is talk a little bit about why I think Kate Packnam and I are here doing this slightly strange thing, which is co-chairing. Um, Jude Kelly asked us if we would do this at one of the uh, Women of the World breakfasts uh, when we were uh, on part of a bit of a committee thinking about what might be on the programme for this weekend. And Jude turned to me and said, would you join the panel on friendship? And I said, if you want someone to be on a panel on friendship, then this woman here is the greatest friend and would be much, much better place to do that than me. And in Jude's rather brilliant mind, we wound up co-chairing. But we've had an extraordinary uh, couple of years, Kate and I. We were friends for 10 years before we started to work together. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that we grew up in the British theatre together. We both started out in our 20s trying to figure out how to try and make a career and find our place. And our friendship was very much a professional one in the sense that Kate was a person I would call when I didn't know what to do about something that had happened at a theatre I was working for. Uh, and it also became, from a professional encounter, a, a really personal one. And I think it's been wonderful to go and... Well, actually, when I got the job at the Donmar, I went and asked Kate if she would leave her current job and come and work with me. And one of the things I really wanted to do was to be able to work alongside someone who I knew was one of the great producers in the theatre industry, but also work alongside my friend. And I think that idea of friendship has informed so much, and I'm sure we'll come on to talk about this, about the way in which we run the theatre that we run together, about how we make decisions, about how we support each other, about how we both went into this quite big and quite frightening job uh, in terms of it being sort of quite a fancy theatre of the Don Moran and, and figured out how to do that. And it's a working relationship that's proceeded along the lines of a friendship. Uh, and it's been a fascinating thing. I don't know what you'd say about that, Kate. Yeah, I, I, everything Josie says is correct, always. Correct. Um, but I think that it's very valuable to us in our working relationship that we have uh, the friendship right at the bottom of our relationship to support what can be difficult times when you're working together. And for me, um, my friends, my uh, few close girlfriends particularly, are that kind of bedrock to my confidence and security. And to know that our working relationship is, has at the, uh, at this bedrock at the bottom that is supporting us is really, really valuable. So things are tricky, but you know down there is this friendship, this trust that you can rely on. And I think that's that's incredibly valuable and we're very lucky to be able to work together with that. Um, I, I uh, have had an interesting uh, sort of recent moment with, a, with my daughter. I have a five-year-old daughter and I realised something kind of quite profound about friendship uh, in the last year where she went off to school and I realised that for the first time in her life she would be choosing her friends. Up till that moment 
I'd been choosing her friends for her. They'd been inflicted on her. They had been sort of given to her. Um, and it, when she walked into school, into a room of um, 60 kids, I, as I let her go into that room, I realised she was going to... Uh, setting off on an adventure of friendship through the rest of her life where she would choose the people who would support her and be that bedrock. And I think, for me, friendship is this amazing adventure through your life where you find where different people come and go in a sense that reflect who you are at different stages of your life and it's a wonderful privilege to watch a child start off and go on that adventure um, and I feel very lucky a lot of my friends are friends from childhood from when I was four or five those very early chosen friendships Josie and I became friends when we were in our mid-twenties and I, I found it much harder now, I'm 38, I find it much harder to make friends than I uh, did as a child. I'm much more cautious, but to have this friendship that's a relatively new friendship, um, 13 years, you know, everything's relative, um, is very precious. So that sort of is my um, offer to the table on friendship. So I was, I was going to start by asking you, Josie, what made you decide to embark on drawing together this great work on friendship? What was the inspiration for that? Um, well, there were a number of things. Uh, I think one of them was actually to do with childbirth and realising that although my family is fantastic, I adore my family, they're not local. Um, and so having my first child was fine. My husband could be with me. There was no problem there. But when it came to the second child, um, you know, you got to go into hospital for a period of labour. What, what on earth do you do? Uh, and it was the friends we'd made through a cooperative crash who took my son in the end for three days, took him to school, took him back. And that is a big ask. And I realised that that is the kind of thing that is happening in the 21st century as, as uh, families become more and more dispersed, that friends are becoming more and more important. And yet, alongside that, friends are also um, being diminished very often, for example, in the media, so that people will often feel that they haven't got time for friendship. You know, uh, actually, work is important, making money is important, um, buying a big house is important, but friendship is something that often gets very marginalised. Um, and so... I then came across an address book, and it was just actually in a, in a, in a shop window in Crouch End, uh, and the joke on the front was, you know, friends, and it divide, subdivided them into categories such as cheats, liars. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, actually, yeah, the, 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 there's a really interesting pull going on here between the, the real and very felt need for friends getting greater and greater, um, but the pressure in the 21st century uh, life uh, being to push friends away. So I was very interested in that and then, and then began to research it and I thought, well, actually, there is a level on which this is going to be not easy, of course, but certainly straightforward. I know about friends. I've got friends. I've had friends since childhood. I've watched my children make friends. Um, and I was very quickly disabused of that when I went to the British Library um, and got out and began to get out a few books. And I thought, well, I'll just have a look at some, what some of the philosophers have got to say. Aristotle, Nietzsche, Kant, Kierkegaard. Uh, so the piles were going up and up and up on the desk. Um, and I did a vast amount of research. And there were various points at which, I'll be honest, it felt slightly overwhelming. Um, and so then I realised actually the thing to do about this is to not worry about the fact that, you know, because of course psychologists have covered it, um, educational psychologists, uh, environmental psychologists, and that's just in the psychology bracket. Um, so it's sociologists as well, moral philosophers, political philosophers, there's a vast literature out there. Um, and, but of course there are also fantastic and very interesting programmes such as Glee. Uh, there's friends on TV, you know, you can't ignore friends. Um, and so I decided that actually it's the personal journey. So I made it a very personal journey through this vast amount of research and, and, and felt very free, actually, by the time I was about a third of the way through the book, to hop between, you know, uh, serious writers such as Elizabeth Bowen um, and Jennifer Aniston and Gwyneth Paltrow. So uh, I, although it was certainly a huge challenge, it was, it was very enjoyable to write. And, and through the process of writing it, I, I really did learn a vast amount 
about friendship, including how crucial it is to value one's friends. Did it change the way your friendships worked at all, in terms of your own personal friendships? I think only in terms of... Uh, may, no, perhaps... Yes, of course it did. How could it not? I was working on it for quite a long time. Um, and w one thing that was very peculiar was that inevitably quite a lot of my meetings with friends were part of the research. Um, and so I would often be having a conversation over a coffee and I'd suddenly have to grab a napkin and scribble a note and, oh, you've just hit, that's so right, you're just tying together what, you know, the friendship that Cezanne and Zola had and you've just nailed it for me. So, um, so there, was a, there was a lot of, of that kind of... Um, they, they were embedded in the research process in a way that I really enjoyed and I think that they enjoyed as well. Um, I think that it made me very interested in the idea that you have to have a set number of friends for your whole life and that there is a, an optimum number of friends and that if you exceed that number of friends your friendships are going to be diminished and I actually came to feel that that certainly isn't the case for me and it's not that you can have 375 or a thousand genuine Facebook friends but that actually we're we've got enough emotional intelligence to sort of distinguish. And of course, there are going to be friends who you need to spend more time with in order to really nurture the friendship. But that doesn't devalue the, those more distant friendships. And sometimes it's a relationship with somebody who you could almost call more, you know, on the acquaintance side of friendship. Uh, sometimes those are some of the most valuable insights you know, some, I don't know, a guy who you know a little bit who works behind the counter in the corner shop, for example. That, those kinds of friendly exchanges could, for example, just really lift your day or they could provide an outside perspective that you, haven't, you, know, that you just haven't ant anticipated. Do you, just picking up on that with your work, Linda, do you think uh, a digital friend or a Facebook friend is a real friend? It very much depends. Um, I think increasingly the online world and the offline world are merging. So this idea that we're online or offline isn't as real. Now, if you look at literature, which is new in psychology in the area of how we engage online, very interestingly, all these things like Facebook and MySpace were set up so we could connect, so really conducive to friendship. What we're finding now is when we log on, we're not so much connecting as we are comparing. Now, comparing is something that we've all done for years, a very normal way of kind of figuring out who I am, who am I in relation to you, in relation to where I am in my life. Um, but when it comes to friendship, one of those great things is that because we've chosen to have that relationship, it's oftentimes underscored by, as much as it can, a sense of kind of unconditional uh, values, unconditional acceptance. And I think, interestingly enough, what's been happening over the past half a decade, not that long, is that we've, we're choosing our friends and what literature shows based on, on sort of the likes, the similarities that they have online. And this is, of course, complicated with the fact that most of the online world is also underpinned by, by marketeers who also tell us who we are. So the way that we form our identities used to be through our friends. Now our friends are online where they're also seeing what products that we buy and what experiences we engage in. So our identities are not just about, oh, hey, we both like netball, or not, as the case we're just speaking. <laughs> uh, I think the case becomes, oh, you know, have we gone on the same trip or are we sending our kids to the same school? Or are we going to the same clubs? And this idea of identity formation in the work that I do, both clinically and, and academically, I think is a very big issue um, with, with especially people in their 20s and 30s, but I think even later on, I think friendship feeds into that. Um, there's a Greek saying, I come from Cyprus, which is, show me your friend and I'll tell you who you are. Hmm. And I've always found that quite fascinating because I think there's certainly something to be said about that um, but if I can think about my friendships they're actually really diverse and maybe it is about the fact that we seek out people that have something that we don't see in the mirror or something that we wish we saw or a piece of us that we'd like to accentuate so I think the whole way that we, we seek out we develop and then what we choose to maintain is important I think the the other thing that um, I found over the years again, in my clinical work, is how sad people are when those friendships end. And um, to a large extent, I guess we buy into the idea that relationships are meant to last forever. I think very sadly, that's not the case. That's not the case with all 
you know, non-platonic relationships or even platonic relationships. Um, and I think understanding that sometimes things develop a lifespan or, or, or can be resurrected after a while is important. But I think the way that we feel about ourselves for failing, you know, to, to, to keep that friendship going is, is really important. I'd love to hear what you all have to say about that later when we, when we open it up. And, and Dorothy, to pick you up on that, um, Dorothy, a lot of your books, your novels, deal with the very exactly what Linda's talking about, the complexities of friendship and betrayal in friendship and whether friendships can survive betrayals. And be resurrected and or, be as you say, come round, have a circle. Um, yeah, I mean, I find that the most interesting thing. With most things I write, um, books I write, I like to look at a situation and make it difficult and see how the person comes out of it. Um, when you talk about my best friend's girl, it's a story of a woman whose best friend dies and she ends up having to adopt her best friend's daughter. And the reason why they weren't friends when her friend died was because she'd had a one night stand with Cameron, the main character. Adele had had a one night stand with her, um, with Cameron's fiance and had a child with him. And so they split up and she was then called upon to look after her daughter. And um, so, yeah, friendship when it goes horribly wrong. And through the book, one of the things that I really enjoyed doing, writing the story, was examining how Cameron dealt with the fact that her friendship with Adele was never resolved before she died and how the end of the friendship made her feel and as you said, you know, your whole identity is sometimes tied up with your friendships. And if you find it hard to make friends, um, it can, when the friendship that you have does go wrong or someone does something to betray you, it kind of becomes who you are, a sign that you're, there's something wrong with you. And that's what Cameron feels. And a lot of my books, there is a, the friendships between the two women in, in the book are always often difficult and unrestrained because, again, it helps to define who they are and find out who they are and the things that they are capable of doing. Um, and, you know, when I was writing My Best Friend's Girl particularly, I kept thinking, I would not do this, I would not do this. But then I don't know if I would or not because I haven't been in that situation. Um, so, for me, friendships are very difficult and you do put yourself under a lot of pressure to to be a good friend and to be there for the other person, even if it at your own personal cost. Um, you can, I'm sure all of us can think of somebody who is a friend that they find that person difficult and you have to put yourself to one side almost when you're dealing with that person and it's not easy to cut them out because you do feel like you've failed and it, there is something wrong with you. I think it's really interesting culturally about the idea, and in your book, Josie, you talk about the sort of best friends forever, and this, and when when so much of our friendships are existing online, the idea that you're dumping a friend, or or in the media, we you talk about the Spice Girls and how they were set up as these best friends forever, and then it's which was a constructed friendship. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about about that and what how that sort of works? Sure. Well, I think it, it comes largely from Aristotle, so it dates back a very long way, which is why it's so embedded. Um, and Aristotle um, said that there were, he divided friendships into three types. So he said that there are utility based friendships, pleasure based friendships, and friendships of ec excellence. And the utility based friendships are, are essentially worthless because they are about mutual gain. Uh, Friendships of pleasure are also worthless because they are just about having fun, uh, getting drunk, that kind of thing. So they're, they're essentially debasing. Uh, friendships of excellence are the only ones that you should aspire to. But according to Aristotle, they're only accessible to highborn males. <laughs> so a little, little bit tricky <laughs> to embrace if you're a woman for a start. Um, the, um, he also said that one of the things that was essential in if you were going to be a really good friend was self-love. And this has continued to be a so, you know, really problematic for philosophers because if it's about self-love, that's about selfishness 
has been argued, and, and, and uh, somebody called Suzanne Stern Gillett has ar argued very powerfully that actually self love is just a basic reality. If, if you don't love yourself, how on earth can you love somebody else? Um, and she's also argued very powerfully that um, actually what Aristotle was doing was responding to a historical context. So that friendship, as it was seen by Herodotus and Homer, for example, was pretty brutal. He, they, they spoke about guest friendship, and really that was about if, if you're in a time of war, trying to conquer the world, as Greece was at the time, um, guest friendship is really about if you're in some kind of you know, deep trouble, the middle of a war situation. Guest friendship is just that if you're one highborn male and you come across another highborn male, you will give each other a bit of food and a bed for the night. And that was, that was as, as good as it got. So that given that accepted view of friendship, Aristotle was trying to turn it into something, you know, that, that actually involved genuine emotions and genuine attachments. Um, and so when he spoke about it being important, if you take it from that position, then it continues to have value. But this, uh, he also said, and this relates to the best friends lasting forever, is that um, you should be prepared to die for each other, that that is the measure. Now, again, I think you wouldn't get too many people saying... <laughs> I, I, I died for you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall on my sword. So I think that that's... That, has, has been problematic for friendship because, and Cicero similarly said, uh, if a friendship uh, can end, it was not a true friendship. Now, like Linda, I completely believe that's not the case. I think you can have a very true, a very genuine friendship. Uh, circumstances can change, distance can come between you. It doesn't in any way devalue what you've had. Um, but I think the, these Aristot Aristotelian values have, have, have cast a little bit of a shadow Linda, how do you think we measure our friendships in the 21st century? What, how do you think we judge and weigh them? What? It's a really great question. I think, um, I think to some extent it's about how they make us feel at its basis level, right? So the whole point of any relationship is that it somehow enhances your life. Now, that doesn't always mean it's going to be easy, but somehow it, it gives you something. Um, I think in the 21st century, given the fact that I think we live in very visual times. I think um, we can't not be creatures of our times and I think one of the things that that's underscored the last few years has been not just materialism but celebrity culture so I think our friendships are also a measure as are our handbags of how we have achieved sadly and and um, or, or you know what our social status um, so I, I think it's a complex it's a complex thing to measure them I think for a lot of us there's um, there's a need to to have that kind of intra-psychic connection I'm an only child. So for me, my friends are like my family. I was interested in what Josie was saying. I, I, they're, they're family that I choose. Um, and I kind of, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, this is Linda, not the shrink talking, Linda, the, the person talking. I kind of think of friendship in terms of level. So I've got a couple of people in my life that I know have my back, no matter what. They've always been there, pretty sure they always will. Then I've got friends that I've got, I have lots of fun with, you know, great hanging out. Then I have friends that, that I know um, great working relationships with, great for a coffee, but not. And each, in each level, I sort of speak to them differently. There's different parts of me. Um, but the idea that, um, that everyone in your friendship group should be able to see those parts of you that are the most vulnerable. And this is a really important point as well. The only way that we really increase intimacy in life is through vulnerability. So when we really get close to friends, that's why I was just thinking of my little girls and friends, and when I hear them talk, they're like, I've got a secret. Well, that's like saying, I trust you. I'm going to show you this part of me, and I'm going to trust you to take care of that. And you know what? We don't really change as we grow up. It is This is the part of me that I'm not sure I quite like, so I'm going to show you, see what you say, and that will kind of give me an idea. And and, and that's what we do. Now, the fact of the matter is if we went around and did that with all of our friends, it's it, probably not the best way forward. So I think this idea of levels of friendship makes sense to me, and I wonder if that's not how, perhaps to some extent, subconsciously, we do manage them and, and relate within them. Um, do we think, I'm going to throw this open to the whole panel, there is a difference between male friendship and female friendship, and how would we begin to talk about that? Josie, you're smiling, so I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> Well, I suppose, I do. Uh, yes, I think it's interesting because I think undoubtedly there, there are differences, but I think it's a very thorny place to be. Um, and actually, when I was thinking about it for the book, I came to the conclusion that a really pivotal 
point is a moment in history, uh, and it's it's associated, you know, associated with law and the change. Uh, it was actually when women got the vote. So I think that one of the things that you're talking about is, can I trust you with a secret? You know, would I do this for my best friend? Um, if you are fundamentally not equal in society, you can't. You know, your friendships are going to be different. And I think things like um, whether or not women were allowed into education. So women were allowed into education very late, both in the university system uh, and in the school system. Uh, but actually what I also became interested in was how friendships were responded to within educational institutions through history. So for example, boys' schools, right from the medieval period, have, have been considered a place where you must nurture really robust boys' friendships. They have to be able to fight and get over it because this is all part of moving into the world Become, moving into a position of power, obviously this is, this is the upper classes, not the working classes, uh, whereas for women, they were actively kept out of education. So for example, the Victorian writer Elizabeth Sewell said, um, it's, it's really bad, school is really bad for, for, for girls, you must educate them in the home with a nanny, singly, ideally, um, because um, their role is to bring up families. We don't want them to know about um, how you can go out and rule a country. So um, given that that was as late as the 19th century, um, I think girls have, have, have had a different kind of run at friendship through history. So yes, they're different, but I think that there's often people slip very quickly into saying, women's friendships are, are catty, women's friendship are, are, are more petty. Um, but I think when you take it in this bigger historical context, um, I, I, I just don't think you can say that that's true. So yes, the reality is different, but that's something that's evolving. And I think the gap is narrowing very fast so that you get uh, things like the friendships that go on between celebrities such as uh, David Beckham and Tom Cruise you know, bromance. <laughs> and the media loves it, this idea that these, you know, big macho males are having kind of womanly friendships. So I think that the gap is narrowing visibly. Um, there's also, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think it just to bring some statistics into it. When you look at the psychology of male and female friendships, um, female friendships tend to be face to face. Male friendships tend to be shoulder to shoulder. Now, what do we mean by that? We're talkers. So when you look at you know, what happens to female friendships, it, it is very much talking over coffee, talking on the phone. For guys, and possibly because they've been socialized into it the way that you're saying, Josie, it's about let's go play, I don't know, tennis together or just randomly you know, rough, rough up someone together. Do something shoulder to shoulder. A big part of that is socialization. The other key difference that we look at is where friendships are very close for women, when they, where they peter off. So in your childhood and your teens and your 20s tend to be very close. Interestingly enough, when you hit those stages where you need help with the kids and it's very forward facing, we tend to kind of pull, pull back, not because of any other reason other than the fact that we're raising a family, we're holding down jobs, and because it is this face to face thing, there's less time for it. Interestingly, uh, we find that they get picked up sort of in, in mid 40s and 50s. Now, for a long time, psychologists just thought that's because we've got more time. But what we're finding now is that the reason for that is is because there is a need for that emotional connection to, to happen throughout. It's not just about the time; it is about a craving for that very important intrapsychic connection. For men, um, what tends to happen is when those relationships peter off, they don't tend to reignite very much because of that socialized isn't there as much but what's really helped has been the online stuff so now because they can connect because they have got the groups they can meet up we're actually seeing an increase so that's a little bit of sort of I guess the more recent studies around that I'm sorry Go on. oh no I was just going to say I I agree with what you're saying about how men find it easier to do things together to go out obviously there's the whole going to the pub culture which is and I don't know sometimes I think I don't know if we actually expect men not to talk about things as deeply with each other as, as they often do. I know my husband's got a couple of good friends that I've known for as long as he has, and when he's had, one of them particularly has, has a problem, he will come and talk to me about it, and I will then have to relay it to my husband, who will then tell me what he thinks, and I will relay it back. To, so they won't actually you know, speak to each other about the problem. 
or they'll talk very briefly about it and then obviously get very embarrassed and, um, about it. But I, I sometimes wonder if we just expect men not to yeah. talk about it or we kind of discourage them from talking about their problems and they find it easier to talk to women because they believe women are easier to talk to. I'm, I'm not sure if it's um, socialised or if it's an innate thing in them. I was really struck by this notion that, um, that men are taught from their earliest friendships to survive a fight so that a friendship can withstand that. Do we think that's the case with women? I don't think they're taught to in the same way. Actually, one of the things that's interesting is you've spoken about the value of sport, and that was something that came through very, very strongly um, in, when I was doing the research, is sport is a brilliant way of interacting. Um, and that's how... That's, it's through a game of rugby. Uh, so if you think about a book like Tom Brown's School Days, um, it's through the, the games of, of rugby and the game of cricket that they, they learn to fight for the side, but, you know, stand down graciously... Um, and when girls' schools were started, um, it, introducing sport was considered really quite dangerous because, of course, this was, you know, late Victorian uh, era. Um, it involved wearing, you know, you couldn't run up and down a lacrosse field in a, in a great big skirt and, you know, with a bodice. So the, the clothes that were worn were kind of had to be quite radical. Uh, and one, one of the things that comes through uh, the the memoirs of various Victorian uh, women is just this absolute love of the opportunity to get exactly that, to get the kind of camaraderie that boys were getting, to get the opportunity to have a fight, to get it out of your system, but in a safe environment on a pitch. And yeah. does that exist for women, do we think? I think there's a real almost caricaturization of female friendships. You know, we mentioned sort of the, the idea of the cattiness or the competition. And, and there's, a, there's a reason for that. We, you know, we objectify women so much. We tell them that their value lies in not competing in sports or political events or in their intellectual prowess. Whereas for men, you know, competition's healthy. Yeah, you, you fight, you fight on the pitch. Every sport we look at onto the group sports, tends to be men, political office. It's, it's, you know, business leaders. We see healthy competition. What's the message to girls? You compete covertly, yeah? So we perpetuate this idea that we don't come in and say oh, we're in competition. We kind of do a mental idea of where we are and what do we compete on on the stuff that never really matters, the, the junk that we've been socialized very much into believing around looks. And I think because of that, this caricature of, of you know, women being just jealous of each other, we're all fighting for the finite resources of men desiring us. Oh, it gets on my nerves so much. And, and I think really, really does. And I've got a little girl and we need to, we so need to change that. Um, we need to stop telling girls that's where their value lies. We need to have, I, I couldn't feel stronger about sports and, and getting women out there to, to view their bodies for what they can do rather than what they look like. And therefore friendships, therefore that we can, you know, fight over something and talk about it rather than pretending it's not real. And I think that's the other thing that, you know, a, you know, a, you know being a Assertive is fine, but being aggressive isn't. But you know, do we see as you know assertiveness in females the same way that we see it in males? Do we make the same kind of allowances, or do we kind of she's being a bit aggressive, she's a ball breaker, you know? Where so it's so how we value conflict resolution, approval seeking. That's the other thing. We know that women tend to be a lot more approval seeking than men. Where does this come from again? This idea that I can't rock the boat. Do you like me? Am I am I okay? Well, maybe if we weren't so worried about that we're more about how do you resolve conflict that's a core thing how do you get up and fight after it so I think it's, it's there's a complex reason why that that very sad caricature still exists because I know without my female friends and without some amazing women who had my back who've always had my back I wouldn't have done half the things I did you know either personally or professionally in my life so it's certainly not been my experience that that's the only way women can be I think uh, okay. Kate and I had an extraordinary experience when, well, actually it wasn't extraordinary, it was sad. When, when we started doing uh, the job together, we did an interview uh, with the Evening Standard that announced our appointments. And the first line of that interview said something like, uh, it's a really striking contrast, you couldn't make it up. She's, she's tall and blonde and she's short and dark. And it kind of signaled this extraordinary, I think, um, sense of, I don't know what you think about this, Kate, but just, just the genuine confusion that the fact of others as a partnership creates. Yeah, and I think that um, it was 
it, the, the point was you come from completely different backgrounds. How could you ever be a partnership? How could you ever be friends? For me, the point of friendship is the celebration of difference uh, in the individual and the support of our differences. And I think that I, as a woman, I think I feel very passionately about that. And I think it's what makes friendships really flourish. Um, and I, I, I think we're very bad culturally and socially at celebrating that. Um, we, we had an ex sorry, I'm now, this is now becoming a slightly oversharing session with the Claw Ballroom, but um, <laughs> we, we had an extraordinary moment. We had a, a press night at uh, the Donmar a couple of weeks ago now, and normally there'll be a party afterwards and there'll be a photographer there. And this uh, fantastic uh, uh, hair and makeup designer who we're, we're pals with, I'm very fond of, uh, came in just looking really great. And we kind of ran over to her and went, wow, you look fantastic. And the, the, the photographer said, um, wow, you're never going to be asked back, are you? And we went absolutely nuts with him until, in the end, <laughs> our press rep has started to calm down. But there's just something very interesting, I think, about that presumption of, of how friendship is, what, what, what that exchange is between women in friendship. And I just wanted to use that um, to ask what you think within friendship women do or should be doing for how women feel about their bodies and about their appearance. You've spoken very eloquently, Linda, about you know, the commercialization, the objectification that we face, but what can friendship do to counter that or reflect it? Do you know, I, I, think, I think it's inevitable that you know, the way that we look is gonna come up. Of course it's there. I think, though, the more we talk about it, actually the worse it is it's like scratching an itch so I, again when you find that that women that friends that engage in fat talk or in old talk actually have much worse body image why we're actually seeking um reassurance for something trying to to make to make ourselves feel better by this you know oh, i'm having a really big day no 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 you're not oh yes i am no i'm fatter no no i'm fatter no well i'm and it's you know it, it's unhealthy it's unhealthy as individuals and as friendships what should a friendship do i think it's about seeing you beyond that my best friends i look at i've had them since i was a kid and i actually hand on heart i think except for those days when they're special and they're different they just look like my friends. They just look like the kids that I fell around with and scraped my knees and fell out with and got better. And, and that, to me, is really liberating. So I think to be able to, to, to see beyond that, you know, the distillation of who we are down to what we look like is one of the most insidious things that we do as a gender, as a society. To have a friendship that won't allow you to distill that. So when you are feeling bad because I hate the size of my knees or my whatever, my butt, whatever it is, to say, do you know what, let's talk, this is ridiculous, you know, you know you're bigger than that, oh, we know we're bigger than that, let's get over that rather than, well, let's deconstruct how big those size should be and let's try, you know, <laughs> just stop it. And also being happy for each other. Again, this is a really big one that I feel so strongly about. You know, it's, it's a cliche for a reason. You're in competition with no one else but yourself. It doesn't matter if you're an Olympic athlete or you're just trying to do your best on the, you know, the next spelling bee. You're in competition with no one but yourself. So I think being able to see friendship as much as you can as that and being able to be proud of each other or happy for each other, as hard as it is, and I know it's hard sometimes. We're human beings. Of course it is. But keeping that in the back of your mind is really important. I'm actually very, I, I rely on my girlfriends and I'm very optimistic about girlfriends' relationships. I mean, I think you look at... Um, uh, hen nights and stag nights and the difference between those type those two kind of events where hen nights girls gather around and they tell each other how much they love each they love the the hen and men go out um, and humiliate each other um, and that seems to be I mean it goes back to the kind of sports field thing but I do think that we are good at it we are um, we can be the best the most brilliant um, supporters of each other and Rely, you know, have, can rely on them so wonderfully. I think, that's, I think it's really important to remember that about your friendships as well and not to, as Linda said, you know, not to buy into when your friend is engaging in negative self-talk, not to engage in it and to, sort of to encourage them almost to basically say, no, you're actually perfect as you are. And it's really hard to remember that as your, yourself and to tell someone else that as well, that, you know, not to listen to the messages from the outside world, but to remember that you are perfect as you are. You may not be perfect in supermodel terms, but you are who you are. 
and you're great, and that your friend is great, and not to encourage them. And to, you know, when they do do something that's amazing, it may be what you want to do, but, you know, to encourage them and to say to them that it's, and I, that I, it's great. Yeah, I think picking up on that, I think the, the fact is none of us are perfect, and what friendship allows us is not to be perfect. Yeah. Friendship is the place that you can be completely imperfect, and in the, that trusting space, you can, you can be your true self. And I think that's really, really worth valuing and remembering as we talk about it. In, um, in your fantastic study of friendship through the ages, did you take away a personal guru, a sort of friendship touchstone? <laughs> um, well, I think actually um, I'm not going to take away one because I took away many, I suppose. I felt that the di diversity of the friends I made in the research was, was a value in itself. But a, a few stand out in relation to the, to the comments that were made just now. And one was that I think that there is a great tendency that's, that's really invited by um, the press, the media, to focus on female friendships that have gone nasty. You know, they loved that thing when Gwyneth Paltrow fell out with Winona Ryder. Supposedly it was because Winona Ryder had gone for the part, but... Winnie had got it and there was a rivalry that simmered and they became frenemies um, and yes you can look at those and of course it's entertaining in the way that kind of you know uh, uh, stories like that are entertaining and, and enticing but actually I think it's also valuable or, or especially valuable to look at some of the really positive role models so for example Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in America um, basically founded the suffragette movement through working very, very tightly with each other, so much so that they wrote several volumes, uh, huge tomes together. Uh, Susan B. Anthony would look after, um, after the... the vast brood of children of her friends while her friend wrote they thought of the ideas together and they wrote very eloquently and inspiringly about how much they could achieve together um, I mean the friendship that you know you two have for example which which is about achieving it's about it's about kind of doing great things together working out troubles together and getting through to some great creative outcomes so I think partly it's about doing exactly what Linda said you know not dwelling on on you know is your bum nicer than my bum kind of thing and, and actually looking at, at the more positive role models and yeah so I think that's what I would do um, I was just going to say actually I found this thing sorry this is a bit sentimental but um, I put this skirt on this dress on this morning and I reached in my pocket and uh, I found a ticket uh, from the opening night of this all-female Julius Caesar that Donmar produced that we uh, transferred to New York and um, it was such a brilliant coincidence that it was in my pocket because this was this kind of great moment that really defined, I think, how in this friendship we could do stuff that we simply couldn't do alone because we opened a show in London one night and then you were already in New York and had opened Julius Caesar out there. I got on a plane and we were at the opening night for that the following night and it would be, have been completely impossible to do that in any other partnership, I think. Um, I'd be really interested to see what you guys think about um, friendships. That's a brilliant example, but it, it's, it's a fascinating thing to navigate, being gr great friends and, and working in a partnership. And um, I don't know, have you got any pointers for what's worked and what's not? I think uh, the trust is the kind of most fundamental. And I think that if it all went wrong, the work, that f the friendship would be there. And in a way, I think that's the kind of the bottom line of it. Um, I think that out of friendship, you find great strength and bravery. And I, I definitely find um, that through my friends, through our friendship and through my other girl friendships particularly, I can be the bravest part of myself. And, and the sort of the, the modern um, compare culture that you talk about, Linda, which I think is so dangerous, particularly for girls, um, is, is, is kind of in conflict with that, um, in the conflict with the kind of the great value that come out of friendship, that strength. And so I, I think it's interesting. I think that, sorry, the, 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 I think the sing, if I was to pick the single most important thing about it, and it's been great for me as a woman, is that um, working alongside you has helped me to stop trying to be good and trying to behave and it's been wonderful to not look for someone to judge what you're doing and I think it's probably made me a lot more rebellious 
You know, I think that when you've got someone you can have that kind of sort of iterative process with, you're able to go, do you know what, let's just do it yeah, in a I way mean, that's been very valuable. Yeah, and I think... <laughs> This is definitely oversharing, but I um, when Josie it's came only and the claw ball when room. Josie yeah when Josie came and said come and can you come and do this job with me at the dom I said I I, list, I for several days listed all the reasons why I was absolutely the worst person all my failings all my inadequacies and Josie stood there and said I know them all I know them all I know it I know it it's rubbish it's rubbish it's rubbish she some of them were really true. But through um, the friendship and the trust that Josie showed me, I've worked through those things. And I think that's um, really fundamental. That this question of perfection and being able to be imperfect in friend with, with the, the strength of friendship around you is core for me, I think, um, and is problematic culturally um, today. Absolutely. Well, perfectionism is... Um I think is one of the most difficult things that, that we're facing, uh, this idea of being superwoman. You know, you kind of think, you know, we're barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen in the 50s and that was fine. Then we burnt our bras and, you know, we had to become, you know, stronger. And then we put on shoulder pads and had to act like men. And now, unless we're on the cover of GQ, having tons of sex in various positions, right, you know, running a <laughs> new multinational conglomerate, raising our kids, baking our own bread, this fetishization of everything, even of baking is getting on my nerves. Enough with the cupcakes. <laughs> the love of God. You know, it's... You know, and, and I think it's, we've become these things to be ticked, these boxes. And I sit there with amazing young women across from me in my clinic who feel despair for not being perfect. And by who, by, by what measure, by whose, what is perfection? And when you sit down and deconstruct it, it's, it's about this idea of having it all rather than having what I want and, and not realizing that knowing what I want is a lifetime process and it constantly changes, at least for me. I mean, what I want from one day to the next is often very different and that's okay. So yes, you're right. This, you know, if it starts, you know, this idea of being a perfect friend or a perfect mom or a perfect, you know, whatever is, is a part of your need to allow yourself to be okay, allow yourself to be okay with who you are. It's not a surprise. And therefore, again, you know, I, I always tend to, I'm not trying to always link things back to body image, but I think I do. That's why, you know, all of these solutions to perfection from the outside in seem so appealing because, hey, if I can inject some poison in my head and stop, you know, being able to move my forehead, that makes that a bit more perfect, then maybe life's a bit more perfect. If I can, you know, these quick fixes, this quick fix culture, friendships, loving yourself, becoming the person you are, none of it is easy. And we've got to stop this, you know, perpetuating this myth to people that it is. I think at the very least that's a call to action that the Claw Ballroom doesn't bake this weekend. <laughs> that's it for the end of this. So, <laughs> with your agreement, Kate Packenham, I think that's a good time to say yes. thank you so much to our panel. Thank you to your fantastic questions. Anything you'd add, Kate? No, thank you very much. I hope we've all found another friend today. <laughs> very good. Thanks, guys.